The guys that appear in this video are delinquents. Please do not under any circumstances imitate anything they do. Don't do it, man. I'm serious. No bad idea. Third shooter. The two suspects appear to have died from self-inflicted gunshot wounds at this time. Uh, the earlier information about a third suspect seems to be a little sketchy. I talked to the people in charge of the investigation, and that third party isn't necessarily considered a suspect at this time, just an associate of maybe one of the suspects. So as far as the actual shooting, uh, we believe that the two suspects that we have found inside, at this time anyway, are the only two that, at least as far as now, that we're, we're looking at. The idea that there was more than two shooters behind the massacre has been speculated for years. The earliest news reports sometimes erroneously stated that there were multiple shooters, but more importantly, a lot of witnesses stated there were multiple shooters as well. The most logical conclusion is that since Harris and Klebold had their trench coats on at one point and took them off at another, they looked different enough to be confused as different people to the frazzled and frightened witnesses. Furthermore, a lot of the kids didn't know Klebold and Harris particularly well anyway, lessening their ability to recognize them on sight. However, an interestingly large amount of witnesses name a certain Robert Perry. Remember him? Robert Perry had either graduated in 1997 or dropped out, but he'd still come back to school sometimes to hang out with his old friends. He was known to have terrible acne, messed up teeth, and a funky body odor. He also sometimes painted his nails and wore mascara. The general consensus is that these witnesses simply confused Klebold for Perry. They were around the same height, both have long hair, and both had a tendency to look like that thing that goes bump in the night. But some of the witnesses were asked if they had confused Perry with Klebold, and while sometimes they said yes once they had time to consider or saw Klebold's photograph, some specifically said no, they hadn't, citing Perry's acne and zit-ridden face, something Klebold didn't have. Also, some said they distinctly remembered it as being Perry because Perry wasn't supposed to be on campus, so he stood out. However, Perry's funky body odor, makeup, and black nails were sometimes erroneously attributed to Klebold, a sign that the two may have been confused before. Another person who was sometimes named as a potential third shooter was Chris Morris, leader of the Trenchcoat Mafia, an out and proud Columbine High School hater. One witness said, when he saw Morris being arrested outside the school, he was 100% sure Morris had been one of the gunmen who shot at him. A co-founder of the original Trenchcoat Mafia, Joe Stair, was also initially a suspect. Like Robert Perry, he'd already graduated in 1998, but still visited the school to see his friends. School counselor Judy Ashway noted, Joe Stair is, quote, very alternative, painted his nails. Stair is, quote, unable to cut his ties with Columbine High School and is constantly seen on campus even though he has been asked not to come on school grounds since he is no longer a student there. Some witnesses were certain Stair was one of the shooters, citing his long blonde hair and remembering Stair in particular because like Perry, he wasn't actually supposed to be on campus. Student Elisha Sinius stated, quote, she stated a student came to the cafeteria yelling, someone just shot someone. She stated everyone started screaming, and she saw three people with guns coming into the cafeteria. Miss Asinius stated one of the gunmen had a long black coat, and she did not recognize him. She stated the other two shooters were a current student and a student that had graduated last year. She did not know their names. She ran upstairs towards the science lab area. Miss Insinius stated, as the gunmen were walking around the cafeteria in the stairway, she heard one of them say, Redacted, where are you? I got three of them. She stated that they were very calm. She and several other students hid inside the science rooms, and they could hear the gunmen throwing things and shooting in the hall and cafeteria. In a slightly later statement, quote, Insinius described the two gunmen as, one, a white male with long brown hair and a trench coat, and he is the one who started shooting at her and the teacher using what she described as a long gun, and two, whom she was unable to describe, and he was observed doing nothing. Insinius stated suspect two did not have a trench coat on. Insinius stated, while in the storage area, hiding for approximately 30 minutes after the start of the incident, when she overheard a calm voice, Redacted, where are you? I got three. And then laughter. Insinia stated it was her belief that the individual said, Redacted, but it could possibly have been, Yo.
Insinius stated sometime before the explosion and after the fire alarm that she heard an individual's excited voice screaming, You are all going to die. You are all going to die. And then laughter. Student Courtney Harivel also recalled hearing Redacted, Where Are You? Quote, At one point, she heard who she thought was a gunman say, Redacted, I have three of them in here. She's very positive that she heard the word Redacted and not the word Yo. Harivel was not able to put a time to hearing that statement. Harivel never saw any gunman when she was in her classroom or in the green room. Harivel did not know Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold. She did know Robin Anderson. Student Dorian Salazar stated, quote, He heard someone in the hall state, I want to die today. And a short time later, the person was yelling, Hey, Redacted, where are you? Dorian stated this was followed by more shots and explosions. Student Ashley McKenna said in her written statement she heard, quote, One guy screamed that he wanted to die. I never saw anybody. In her interview with police, she elaborates that she heard, quote, Boy voices and that she heard one of the same boy voices yelling, Redacted. The statement with the name Redacted was made referencing him to come to them or to go. Nicole Lawson mentions in her statement that McKenna heard, Come on, Joey. Further, a lot of students remembered Joe Stair having a history of being pretty fucked up. When asked by police if she saw anyone acting strange prior to the incident, student Ashley Pimley said, I know a girl named Stephanie Kenny that was in my art class last year, and Joe Stair and her would talk German to each other. They talked about how they didn't believe in God, end quote. Not really suspicious behavior per se, more like they'd just been paying attention in German class? Anyway, student Jennifer Perlman stated she'd known Stair from an elementary school they'd both attended. She, quote, did not know much about him other than she recalled that he was really quiet around people. She said, while they attended Judge Creek Elementary School, people would make fun of Joe Stare due to the way he acted and due to the way he would stand in the same spot and just stare at the female students. Jennifer said that she recalled in high school, Joe Stare would wear a jean jacket with some type of racial comments on it, and she believed those racial comments had something to do with slavery. However, she was not positive. Jennifer said he also had something on the jacket that was written against females. However, she was not sure what that was either. Jennifer said she has not seen Joe Stair since graduation in the spring of 1998. A redacted student was interviewed by police. On May 5, 1999, I was contacted by Redacted, who stated that his parents had called him and asked him to call me in regards to his knowledge of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. I asked Redacted if he had ever had any contact with either one of them and if he had any reason to be on a hit list that they had made up. Redacted stated that he had never had any direct contact with them, but he had major contact with Joe Stair. I asked Redacted if he could tell me what that was, and Redacted stated that his whole class was afraid of Stair. We thought he could carry out his threats. I asked Redacted what those threats were, and he related the following story. Redacted stated that he had been in the cafeteria, sitting at the jock table, when Stair came into the cafeteria, acting like a f quote, humping some other kid from behind, so we all yelled at him. I think we said something like, knock it off, That's when he yelled that he would just blow up the school because he didn't like anyone there anyway. We all believed he could do it, so we told a peer counselor named Lindsay Wojciak, who talked to both Stare and Dutro. Eric Dutro was another member of the Trenchcoat Mafia. Redacted didn't know what the outcome of that meeting was. Patrick McDuffie, a senior who completed his graduation requirements in December 1998, said Joe Stair was the first to start the trend of wearing trench coats and dusters to school, since he didn't want to be cold and wet while hanging out in the smoking pit outside the school. McDuffie also details how the trench coat mafia started and how Klebold and Harris were later associated. Other members of the group began wearing the oiled leather dusters and soon obtained the label Trenchcoat Mafia. McDuffie stated that the group's common interests were as follows. Music, Ramstein, KMFTM, Sick, Computers, Strategic Games, Command and Conquer, Dune, Warcraft, Movies, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Replacement Killers. McDuffie communicated with the group through America Online, AOL, using the name Romeo. He stated that Eric Harris was Reb and Chris Morris was Grunt. Dillon Klebold, sick, did not have AOL, but used the computer name Vodka. 
McDuffie became part of the trench coat mafia, TCM, in May 1997. At that time, Dillon was wearing Ramstein and KMFTM t-shirts. McDuffie wore a duster, which he got from Chris Morris. Other students continued to call them TCM, and they adopted the title. Two members of the TCM, Chris Morris and Robert Perry, would fight a lot among themselves, but not with other students. McDuffie was in the chess club with Dillon Klebold. Chris Morris did not like jocks. Most problems were with the football players from the previous year. Eric Harris did not like black people. McDuffie says he believed two redacted students would have been the ones to commit a violent act like the massacre and that he suspected them until suspect identification was made. He also mentions that Chris Morris was one of around 15 kids who detonated three pipe bombs under tree stumps in 96 or 97. Some of these kids were from the adjourning high school, Chatfield High. Quote, everyone has a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook, which is downloaded from the internet. Dillon has an ASP baton, which he carried in his car. The ASP was purchased at a security store in Southwest Plaza Mall. Dillon purchased a shotgun on his 18th birthday, either from a Kmart or a Walmart. There had been loose talk in the group about someone owning an Uzi. This talk was circulating in late 1997. The group used to discuss guns such as the AK-47 and MP5. When asked about videos made by the group TCM, McDuffie stated a video was made as a joke against the jocks. There was a dummy made out of pillows, dressed in football gear, which was then assaulted by the group. When asked about drug use, McDuffie stated Harris and Klebold smoked marijuana, but used no other substances. McDuffie felt Klebold and Harris could have manufactured the bombs in three days. Sometimes Klebold and Harris wore Soviet lapel pins. McDuffie stated he stopped wearing the dusters last semester, 1998. McDuffie was home the day of the shootings and was not able to provide any information concerning the scene. Richard Long, an educational technology specialist at the school, described a redacted student, quote, Mr. Long said that he kicked redacted out of the computer lab for accessing satanic sites. This happened last year. Mr. Long said that he didn't see redacted the day of the shooting. He has seen Redacted in a black trench coat. He described Redacted as weird and evil. When asked to articulate this, Mr. Long said that Redacted personally was dark and Redacted was gloomy. When Mr. Long would confront Redacted, Redacted would tell him that he had rights. This Redacted student is suspected to be Joe Stair. Here's a news report featuring Joe Stair interviewed after the massacre. One of the founders of the group called the Trenchcoat Mafia tells NBC News four of them have been questioned by police. Joseph Stair says none of the other Trenchcoat Mafia knew of the specific plan to attack the school, but did expect some revenge on athletes at Columbine High after four years of battles. We hated each other. We really did. The athletes would threaten us leave notes in lockers. As they were driving by, they'd throw glass bottles and rocks and things at us. And so their large hatred built up between the two groups. Stair says Harris and Klebold asked for no help. He says some members of the trench coat mafia, including himself, did make pipe bombs frequently as, quote, something to do. But he says the two suspects knew enough about planning an attack and making bombs to pull it off alone. They knew how to make just about every type of explosive that you could make using household products. Bomb experts inside the building tell NBC News the two suspected shooters died together in a back corner of the library, both victims of self-inflicted shotgun blasts, their weapons all around them. Joe Stair went on to get married, but eventually got divorced and went on to kill himself in 2007 by strangulation. His sister Amanda, who was in the library during the massacre, said in 2007 that she doubted the massacre had anything to do with his suicide, since it had been a while since anyone had accused him of being involved, and there were other personal woes going on in his life at the time. And to kind of round out the character profile of Stair, there was a faculty member who mentioned he never had problems with Stair, who was nice and polite, and that he only had problems with Brian Sargent. And of course, his family and friends have said that he was a friendly, genuine, good person to be around. 
Other witnesses named mysterious figures, such as, quote, suspect with short blonde hair, like he was going bald, older, in his 30s, or the even more peculiar scenario, Klebold and an older suspect, 25 to 30, blonde, with short, spiky, buzz-cut hair. Some students, such as Caitlin Place, said they'd seen pictures of Klebold and Harris, and that the shooters they saw didn't look like them. In the police report of David Eagle, another witness, quote, he has since seen pictures of Harris and Klebold on television. David said that the person he saw did not look like the people he's seen on television. Notice, though, how vague his description of the shooters is. Trouble is, early news reports on the massacre were showing outdated yearbook photos of Klebold and Harris. Harris is lacking the spiky hair he sports in his more recent senior photos, and Klebold's hair is much shorter, lacking the distinctive clown-like curls a lot of witnesses reported he had on the day of the attack. In the end, a lot of this third shooter business is likely due to witnesses getting confused because of bad information and being in an understandably panicked state of mind at the time. Eyewitness testimony is notorious for being inaccurate, which is why it's usually supplemented with some kind of indisputable physical evidence in courts of law. But some question, if it's just mistaken identity, why would so many witnesses say otherwise with such certainty? One, it could be due to a phenomenon now widely known as the Mandela Effect, where masses of people have incorrect recollections of factual events. For example, its namesake, where many people incorrectly believed they'd seen Nelson Mandela's funeral on TV decades before his actual death. Others include mishearing lines in movies, remembering movie lines that weren't there, or misremembering logos and song lyrics. There are other Mandela effects within the Columbine witness testimony specifically. For example, several eyewitnesses mistakenly listed Klebold, Stare, or Perry as being as tall as 6'8", or even 6'11", when they were all considerably shorter than that. Some recalled the shooters wearing balaclavas, or face masks, when they had not. Some remembered seeing a shooter in a tie-dye shirt or leather pants when there's no evidence of that either. Some witnesses' testimony became distorted over time. For example, Chris Wisher, who mentioned seeing only two suspects in his initial interview, then, in a later interview, added a third. And some were influenced by rumors, such as Brian Fry, who'd heard a rumor that a redacted student, likely Robert Perry, had turned himself in as one of the shooters. Fry then became convinced that the shooter he'd seen was that student, when in fact, he would ultimately identify the shooter as Klebold after being provided Klebold's picture from CCTV. Second, Harris and Klebold were not famous or super popular students before the massacre. In a school of over a thousand students, they were virtually unknown to some. You may have noticed that several witnesses mentioned not knowing or barely knowing Klebold and Harris. Brian Fry could recognize Klebold's physical attributes, but thought his name was Harris. Other witnesses described shooters with the physical characteristics or the same clothing as Harris and Klebold, but could not identify them by name. In the extended police report with David Eagle, when asked if he'd seen Klebold and Harris on Monday or Tuesday, Eagle responded, if I did, I wouldn't know it was them. One student, Daniel Ricks, said that a redacted student, despite this student's distinctive appearance, could be confused for Robert Perry, Dylan Klebold, Brooks Brown, and Nate Dykeman, because their general appearance was similar, particularly their height. He also said he believed the reported sightings of this redacted student at the school during the shooting were actually sightings of Klebold due to their similar physical appearances and the fact that they both wore their hats backwards. Ultimately, the investigation determined the only confirmed shooters were Klebold and Harris and cleared the other suspects. Reb Doomer and Harris Wads Eric Harris loved Doom. He wrote about it over and over and over. He drew lots of Doom monsters and figures in his journal and yearbooks. He even wrote about it for school as the number one most important thing in his life. Doom is so burned into my head, my thoughts usually have something to do with the game, whether it be a level or environment or whatever. In fact, a dream I had yesterday was about a deathmatch level that I've never even been to. It was so vivid and detailed, I will probably try to recreate it using a map editor. What I can't do in real life, I tried to do in Doom. Like if I walk by a small building, I would recreate it as good as I could and then explore it, go on the roof, under it, or even shoot at it. 
The fact is, I love that game. And if others tell me, hey, it's just a game, I say, oh, I don't care. On Harris's AOL profile, he lists himself as a professional doomer. He even sent letters to ID Software, developers of Doom, and had copies of the Doom novels. Reb Doomer was one of Harris's most infamous AOL profiles because he set up a website under a similar name to showcase his Doom wads. What's a wad, you ask? It's an acronym for Where's All the Data and is a file format used by Doom in all games with a Doom-based engine. You start with an IWAD, which typically has all the core files for running the game, and if you want, add a PWAD, which can replace certain files from the IWAD or provide additional ones. Players use WADs to mod their own levels of the game. ID Software is famous for not only allowing fans to mod their own levels, but actively encouraging it. John Carmack, Doom's main developer, released the game's source code in 1997, so fans could modify the engine itself. Anyway, Harris infamously modded several wads for Doom 2, and at least one for the game Quake. Some of his Doom 2 levels include Deathmatching in Bricks, Killer, Mortal Kombat Doom, and Station. But his best-known wad is the last one he created, UAC Labs. In the readme that accompanies each level, Harris voices disdain for cooperative 2-4 player mode, writing, it's available, but quote, boring as hell though. His station wad, he writes, is just one of my awesome deathmatch wads, so be sure to check out my wad page for the others. He mentions these wads are under strict protection, no modding or building of your own. In his earliest wad, he starts out rather gently with these copyright warnings. You may distribute this wad, provided you include this file with no modifications, and tell me you are going to do it, but don't put it on the internet. Also send comments after you play this level. They will be greatly appreciated. But by UAC Labs, things have escalated. You may not change a damn thing with this wad. If you do, I will blow you up, and it will be cool. In the readme for Deathmatching and Bricks, he writes, It took me about three days to completely finish this ass-kicking wad. This is by far the best deathmatch level I have made yet. Yet, yet, yet. He also gives credits to, uh, my good friend Dylan Klebold for helping me playtest this wad, and of course, the creators of Doom 2. The text file for UAC Labs reads, What's up all you Doomers out there? Reb here, bringing you another kick-ass Doom 2 wad. This one took a damn long time to do, so send me some bloody credit, man. Sorry the file is so damn big, but you know how it is when you change sprites. Well, you should know if you've ever made wads like this. Enjoy the new death frames. Made them all myself. The description section reads, Okay, here goes. After defeating the demons on Earth, you learn of a new terror, Phobos. Where this hellish battle all began has been taken over again. When you were fighting hell on Earth, the demon backup crew decided to pay a visit to Phobos again. No problem, right? All the installations were already destroyed by you in the first attack, right? Yeah, that part's right. But half the surviving humans from Earth took refuge there. We just redid the structures to fit our needs and moved in again. Bad idea. Those gates were still active. So, ah, uh, chalk up another kill for the demons. After the second attack on Phobos, only 99% of the human population is left. Once you emerged from hell, you took the first ship you could to Phobos. Once again, there were no survivors. Now, it's payback time. Those goddamn alien bastards are gonna get one hell of a BFG blast up their freaking ass. You land on the other side of Phobos, where the humans landed for the second time. Your mission is to destroy the two main gates and destroy the platoon of demons at the main teleporter from Phobos to Earth. Use the maps, you'll need them, to find all the hidden secrets and doors. Beware of the two gates, the R still active, and more demons might come through any second. The platoon guarding the teleporter out is very large, so beware. Good luck, Marine, and don't forget, kill them all! Because of the fairly gruesome nature of the text, especially when considering the massacre, UAC Labs went down in infamy. But again, it's all kind of in hindsight. Harris's wads didn't seem to get much attention prior to the event, and I doubt they would have been seen as any darker or weirder than most wads if not for the actions of their creator. As early as the day after the massacre, other Doom players and fans have been split on whether Harris's wads were actually good or just mediocre. Most seem to agree that they were nothing special, but not too bad for a high school sophomore and senior. One common complaint with UAC Labs in particular is that there were too many secrets in the levels, to the point where it got annoying. But it's also been praised for having some good stylistic qualities. And, especially in recent years, some are of the opinion it was actually a great wad. 
As many have noted over the years, Harris had the potential to be a good game developer. I think he could easily have been with thousands of other indie game developers of the early 2000s, and even today, had he kept going. And since he would have been getting in on the ground floor, he may even have had some success. As a side note, it's kind of interesting to see these guys conflicted over the fact that Harris was a mass murderer, but also see them talk about Harris as if he's just another game dev, critiquing his wads and even defending them at times. It's a little bizarre when you really step back and look at it. It's like it's got this, dude, he sucks, but it's not the wads' fault, energy. A big rumor that started not long after April 20th was that Harris had created a wad based on Columbine High School as a practice ground of sorts but no record of this supposed level has ever been found. Reb and Vodka So, if you've seen any of the earlier parts of the iceberg, or if you've done a little research on these guys before, by now you'd be accustomed to hearing the names Reb and Vodka, and you'd know their aliases for Harris and Klebold. Harris considered himself a rebel, as you can see in this school report from 1995. The Columbine Rebels was also the name of the school's sports teams, including football, baseball, and basketball. Harris used to be a Columbine Rebel in his freshman and sophomore years playing soccer. According to an article published May 1999, Eric had played soccer, left forward and midfield, says Columbine senior and former soccer teammate Josh Swanson. He was not a star, but he was solid, and Josh recalls seeing Eric's parents standing on the sidelines during games. In fact, the summer between sophomore and junior year, Klebold joined Harris's soccer team. But he hadn't played since kindergarten, and while he was strong, he wasn't well coordinated or athletic in general. He sucked and the team lost. According to Mrs. Klebold, Eric started screaming at Dylan over Dylan's bad performance, flying into such a rage that all the other parents and kids were staring at him, and the Harris's had to lead him away. While Dylan's parents were disgusted and pissed over Eric's behavior, Dylan himself seemed nonchalant, and when his mother asked him if it hurt his feelings to be yelled at like that, he said, nah, that's just Eric. Anyway, soccer seemed to be something Harris cared a lot about. Even though he dropped out of playing for the school's teams and wanted nothing to do with rebel pride or school pride in general, Harris still played soccer in an extracurricular soccer club called Columbine Rush, which was merged into Colorado Rush SC in 1997. Whether Reb stems from his years on the Rebel sports team or not is unknown. Harris typically spelled Reb in all capitals and it was the name he was known by at work and online. Some of his co-workers thought it was his actual name or didn't know his real name and called him Reb when giving statements to investigators. Others knew his real name but knew that Eric didn't like to be called that and that he would even get mad if he was called by his real name. Klebold seemed less attached to his nickname, which he hadn't chosen, but had been given to him by friends after he drank an entire bottle of vodka in a short time. Apparently this incident happened when he was 15 or younger, as he writes the nickname in his earliest journal entry in March of 1997. Klebold nearly always spelled his name using alternating caps. At the time, alternating caps were frequently used to create messages in the capitalized letters for example, the email service Hotmail, whose once capitalized letters stood for HTML. This practice or trend is what probably led many to assume Klebold would have spelled his name like this to showcase his initials. For whatever reason though, Klebold did not jump at this opportunity and spelled his nickname like this. Klebold also liked to put his name in left and right assignment operators, typically used in R programming, a language designed for computational statistics and graphics. But it's unlikely Klebold was using R back in 1997 unless he was really on the pulse of the latest programming languages, though he could have been using S, the precursor language that R is based on. Or he could have just used the brackets randomly because it was trendy or it just looked cool. Interesting tidbit, the super assignment operator is infamous for its potential to make otherwise healthy code confusing and unreadable. While it can be useful, you should employ it with caution. Bill Venables, one of the main programmers behind the S and R languages, even said he wished it had never been invented. Some have speculated that Reb and Vodka were more than just nicknames. They were representations of the more deviant sides of Harrison Klebold's characters. Brooks Brown wrote in his book, No Easy Answers, Eric had spray paint cans and super glue, and he told us how he and Dylan would sneak over to people's houses and vandalize them because the person had said or done something at school that had pissed them off. 
Perhaps Eric and Dylan would glue someone's doors shut or write words on their front lawn. They did these acts not as Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, but as Reb and Vodka, the Rebels. Ralph A. Larkin writes in Comprehending Columbine, Prior to the Columbine attack, Eric and Dylan acted upon their anger by vandalizing homes of people whom they regarded as enemies or people who had slighted them in some way. Eric chronicled their exploits on his website under the title Mission Logs. The acts of vandalism described in the website were validated by a Columbine resident whose house was vandalized in ways similar to Eric Harris's descriptions. As part of their personas as members of a paramilitary terrorist group, they adopted Nam de Guerre. And, of course, many have taken note at how they were Reb and Vodka when referring to each other on the basement tapes. Some witnesses also recalled hearing the shooters call each other by Reb and V during the massacre. There are some instances that could support the theory that their nicknames were, in a way, distinct alter egos. For example, Harris calls himself Reb throughout most of his journal. He refers to himself as Eric only once at the end of the journal, when describing him in the negative way he thought others perceived him. Don't let the weird Eric kid come along. Oh no. But when it comes to Reb, he writes, people, in other words, parents, cops, God, teachers, telling me what to do, think, say, act, and everything else just makes me not want to fucking do it. That's why my fucking name is Reb. No one is worthy of shit, unless I say they are. Klebold, who seemed to have a fractured sense of self-identity in general, seemed to think that his old self had been overwritten at some point. I wonder how, when, I got so fucked up with my mind, existence, problem. When Dylan Bennett Klebold got covered up by this entity containing Dylan's body, he writes about how this other entity has none of Dylan's humanity, but that it has more intelligence than the original Dylan. At one point he writes, Redacted can get me that gun, I hope. I want to use it on a poor SOB, I know. His name is Vodka. Dylan is his name, too. He also writes, in an unsent locker note to a girl, I denied who I was for a long time, until high school, which could be referring to a discovery or acceptance of his so-called second self or alter ego. Alter ego is Latin for other I. It can be as simple as a different or alternative side to one's original personality, or it can be as complex as an entire secret identity. You see this a lot in popular movies and TV shows, and even some supervillains are one identity by day, another by night. An alter ego can be an artistic statement, a persona cultivated for the sake of performance. David Bowie was pretty famous for doing that, had a new stage persona for basically every decade. An alter ego can be something that was always there, but had to be discovered. Many people describe finding a new confidence or even a new way of looking at the world once they started dancing or acting or whatever new skill or hobby they were passionate about. Some people try to get in tune with their alter egos by going to clubs or drinking, taking psychedelics, or simply trying new things. Having an alter ego is nothing special. Humans are many-sided by default. Discovering the numerous sides of your character is a process that goes on basically forever, and teenagers are king at this sort of thing. Maybe it's because their society doesn't chain them to staying in one personality the way you're expected to in the adult world. I mean, if you're a kid and you're a brooding goth one day and a purple-haired gamer the next, people tend to say, uh, you're just going through a phase, but try that as an adult and you'll likely get told you should see a therapist or grow up. In general, teenagers are encouraged, to some extent anyway, to explore the various sides of their personality and choose the one they like best, whereas adults are expected to have chosen one already and are expected to stay consistent in that one personality, for the most part. Or, it could be that the adolescent brain is just more malleable and conducive to change, and therefore teenagers find it easier to shift between alter egos or personas. Klebold and Harris specifically had a distinct persona shift, at least outwardly, after freshman year of high school. According to some of their classmates, Klebold and Harris used to be fairly preppy and run-of-the-mill guys, and then, in their junior and senior years, their clothes style, tastes, and general personalities seemed to get darker. Some associated this change with the trench coat mafia. Klebold and Harris seemed to lose quite a few friends and some of their social status because they chose to hang out with the TCM, who most of the school made fun of and disliked. And what did they do? Uh, they just 
they don't really do anything. They just keep to themselves and they just stick out because they always wear like black clothes and dark and long trench coats and army clothes and stuff like that. Dark clothing, glasses, berets. They get, they get made fun not of a lot. lot. A lot of kids like them. Yeah. They get made fun of a lot. Yeah. yeah. By other students sometimes. Others attribute it to the bond between Harris and Klebold, theorizing that neither boy would have ever gone so far into their darker sides had they not been influenced by each other. In the end, Klebold and Harris likely did have what you could call alter egos. Many who knew them described them as two-faced, many-sided, and as leading double lives and having secret sides after the attack. But then, so does basically everyone. Alter ego is just a fancy word for a different side to a person's character. So even if Reb and Vodka did stand for their alter egos, I don't think it's that significant on its own. It's more the violent and destructive thoughts, the miscells, nicknames or no nicknames. <laughs> Austin Eubanks One of the most famous survivors of the massacre was senior Austin Eubanks, born a month after Klebold. He was in the library when Klebold and Harris started gunning it down and was hiding under the table with Jennifer Doily, a second unidentified student, and Corey DePooter, whom Eubanks had been friends with since freshman year. Um, and I met Corey. Almost immediately, Corey and I became best friends. All of a sudden, I had this person who was literally a mirror of myself. We had the same interests. We enjoyed doing the same things. We fished, we played golf, um, and we became inseparable. And April 20th, 1999, Corey and I were together. We were going to meet friends to go out to lunch and we walked into the library and Corey was the first person to say, it sounds like gunshots. And five minutes later, the teacher runs into the library and screams, everybody get under the tables. We didn't know what to do. It was immediate shock. What's going on? Is, is this a joke? This can't be happening. I remember Corey saying, don't worry, the cops will come. We'll get through this. 11 minutes later, Corey was dead. Klebold and Harris shot DePooter three times at close range in the chest, neck, and left arm, and Eubanks was right next to DePooter, witnessing his demise. DePooter was the last murder victim in the attack. Klebold also shot Eubanks in the hand and in the knee, but Eubanks was so full of shock and adrenaline that he didn't even feel it. When the shooters left the library, he didn't realize he was injured until he started running for the emergency exit. I left the library and went to a triage of police vehicles and I was in complete shock. I felt nothing. Naturally, nearly losing your life in a massacre on your school, a massacre that left even seasoned SWAT members and police investigators shook to the core, and watching your best friend die in front of your eyes is the type of thing that gives you trauma for a lifetime. We have seen his pictures, but Corey DePooter's parents want us to know the person in the photos. He was honoring. He was special and everyone. A proud mother talks about her late son. Relatives gather to exchange memories of the 17-year-old who was fatally shot while studying in the school library. At the time of that shooting, Corey was with his friend and fishing buddy, Austin. Austin survived his gunshot wounds and has filled in some of the details of Corey's final minutes. He says Corey was the first one targeted by the gunman and that he died almost instantly. We had all these nightmares of being brutally tortured or, or laying there for hours dying with nobody getting to him. So it was a comfort to know that Corey was, it was fast. The day he died. Corey's grandfather recently retired as a military explosives expert. On Tuesday, when he heard there were bombs inside the school, he desperately wanted to help. I, I probably couldn't have, and I know that, but, but I would have liked to have been with him. The DePooters have a big family, and from the time Corey was a baby, they showered him and his sister with attention. That gives this family great comfort that while Corey's life was much too short, it was rich with love for all his 17 years. Suzanne McCarroll, News 4. Because he had been shot, Eubanks was rushed to the hospital after the shooting and doped up on a variety of medications. As a result of my injuries, I was pretty significantly medicated about 45 minutes after being shot. 
I remember immediately being drawn to that feeling because it took the emotion away, he said of the pain medication in 2018. You lose a best friend, you lose a sense of safety. I was in all this turmoil, and now I feel better, he said in 2016. I liked that. After his surgery, Eubanks was prescribed a 30-day supply of pain meds, and an addict was born. I was prescribed a variety of substances for anxiety, pain, you name it. And all I knew was that a lot of educated people were prescribing me substances to make me feel better, and it was working. So when I look at what happened after Columbine, it was only three months and I was in active addiction. Eubanks went on to graduate in 2000, but never returned to Columbine, instead getting tutored privately three days a week. Quote, it was in 2006, seven years after Columbine, that he started to suspect he had a problem. By then, he developed a tolerance to the prescription meds, so he started taking illicit drugs, cocaine, ecstasy, and he was drinking in excess. By that point, I had really started to experience the downward spiral of addiction and was thinking, wait a second, maybe this isn't right. Starting that year, Eubanks went into residential treatment three times, but nothing stuck. Unfortunately, 2006 wasn't the end for me. I left treatment and I went back to using. Finally, in 2011, I woke up in jail and I had no idea how I got there. I was in withdrawal um, and I had no recollection of the day prior. I was completely blacked out. The police report said I passed out at a restaurant and the paramedics were called and I had a warrant for a probation violation. And I remember thinking that day, if I don't figure this out, I'm gonna die. So I found another treatment center. I followed instructions. I put one foot in front of the other and I moved on. I found myself processing grief and trauma that I had experienced at age 17 at age 29 because I was finally free of substances and I could effectively go through the stages of grief. I was able to resolve that trauma and get to a place um, where I could have a healthy foundation for living, moving forward. 18 months later, I got my first job in addiction treatment and I've been working in the industry ever since. After his recovery from addiction, Eubanks became a motivational speaker, working to help others in their battles against addiction. He was a program director at the Foundry, an addiction treatment center in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, near where he lived at the time, and was also executive director of the Quiet River Transitional Recovery Community in Denver. On May 18, 2019, Eubanks was found dead of a heroin overdose at his home. He is succeeded by his two sons, Caden and Landon. Tomorrow, an autopsy will be performed on Columbine survivor Austin Eubanks. He died yesterday, just days after we talked to him in Pasco County. He told us his story of survival and how he persevered through tragic times. Eubanks traveled the country hoping to help those struggling with addiction by telling his story. He was shot during the 1999 Columbine school shooting and his best friend was killed. Yesterday, he was found dead in his home in Colorado. No foul play is suspected. His family sent out a statement saying Eubanks lost the battle with the very disease he fought so hard to help others face. As you can imagine, we are beyond shocked and saddened and request that our privacy is respected at this time. Survivors slash witness accounts. I saw him, I said, hey, Isaiah. And uh, he goes, he came out of the table and he said, what's up? And uh, he sat between me and Matt. And uh, that's when uh, to uh, tall kids with trench coats on they uh they came into the library and uh they were they were shooting off their guns at people and uh they came in and they were uh harassing students before they uh they shot them they and, were saying, uh, saying racial slurs to isaiah yeah they uh they said uh get any uh F and jock, they said get anybody with a white hat on because that's a lot of jocks wear white hat and they... Baseball caps. Right, I was wearing a white hat and I threw it under my shirt. And Isaiah, Isaiah did kind of look, he was, a, he was a buff little kid and he looked like a, a jock. He was uh, well built. And uh, they walked by and they saw Isaiah. And uh, one of them said to the other one, they said... Uh, I said, there's a N-word over here. And uh, the other other kid came over, 
and saw him and uh, Isaiah tried to back up. I, Isaiah didn't say anything. Uh, and they shot Isaiah. And uh, then they shot uh, my friend uh, Matt also. And then you you played dead, Craig. Yeah, um, I, I just ended up laying on the floor. I, I, was, I was praying to God uh, to give me courage and to keep protection over us. And uh, he told me to, uh, he told me to get out of there. He told me, uh, God told me to get out of there. And I got up and everybody was in shock. And I said, I told everybody, I go, let's get out of here. Let's run out of here. And they all got up and, uh, and some girl asked me to help her. Her arm was, uh, she had a, uh, a chunk of her shoulder was blown off by a shotgun. And, uh, some kind of rifle, some bigger weapon. And, uh, I helped her get out. A lot of facts about Columbine, including the bulk of the 11K, come from students, survivors, and witnesses. There were tons of television interviews and interviews with investigators and police, each coming from a different perspective. Together, they form quite the experience. If you're looking for the clearest overall picture of this event, combing through these pages and hours of footage is where it's at. And if you want to see the true nightmare everyone in that community went through, witness accounts of the attack and footage of the survivors afterwards is also where you'll find it. For example, here's Mark Taylor, who was shot at the entrance of the school. Although he was shot four times, Mark Taylor is one of the lucky ones. Lucky because police got to him quickly after he was shot outside an entrance to Columbine High School and dragged to safety. I thought I was going to die. Lucky because doctors say he will be okay. I was just standing with my friends and I heard a gunshot. I fell a pain in my leg and I fell. And I fell a couple more and I just dropped. And then I saw him uh, with a grenade. And he was coming towards me. And then a police officer <coughs> came and he ran off. Here's Richard Castaldo, who was paralyzed in the massacre. I am I'm glad to be going home today. Makes, makes I guess it makes me like a little bit nervous trying to, you know, go home after all this and you know, do all the stuff that I need to do, but I think I'm pretty much ready. At least according to the hospital, I guess I am, so. On April 20th, two gunmen shot Richard and Rachel Scott as they ate lunch outside the Columbine cafeteria. Scott died. Richard was shot up to nine times. One bullet paralyzed him from the chest down. See, I do want to get involved in a few things, uh, such as, uh, you know, spinal cord research. I like to get involved with gun control, help make the laws better about that. Um, I want to see, you know, like every place to be handicapped, handicap accessible. His focus on the future is intentional. He wants a life back. Just that uh, you gotta keep on moving, I guess. And here's some footage from directly after the massacre. We heard, like, popping, and we didn't know what it was, and then I looked out the window, and there's this guy throwing, like, a pipe bomb at all the cars. And then he came in, the, they, like, started blowing up and shooting everyone in the cafeteria. And then you could hear them laughing and running upstairs, and they were shooting anyone of color wearing a white hat or played a sport. And they didn't care who it was, and it was all at close range. <laughs> What did you see? You have blood on your hands. <laughs> Everyone around me got shot, and I begged him for 10 minutes not to shoot me. Oh. <laughs> and he just put the gun in my face and started bleeding everywhere and started laughing, saying that it was all because people were mean to him last year. Who were these people? I don't know. Killed my best friend. Yeah, mass chaos. 
Okay. They pulled them down out of police cars from the back of the school to get them away from the school, and they set up a triage area here, I think, just to, to get the wounded as quickly as they can. Here comes, right. here comes, here comes another car down now. They're just bringing them down as fast as they can find them, and they're getting them out of there, getting them away from the school, getting them fixed up, stabilized, and then getting them to the hospital from here. A number of witnesses recognize the two as members of a group called the Trench Coat Mafia. Yeah, they like wear trench coats every day to school, like, and wear makeup and paint their nails and stuff. They're just like, uh, I don't know, everyone kind of thinks of them as different, and they always just hang out with themselves only, kind of associate themselves with, like, death and violence. They always wear black clothing or dark clothing, glasses, berets. They get they get made fun of a lot, lot. A lot of kids like them. Yeah. They get made fun of a lot. Yeah. yeah. By other students sometimes. I heard people pray for their husbands, their children, <laughs> you, know you name it. Yeah. And uh, huh? at that well, point, these guys were killing them just to kill. Senior Nick Foss witnessed the horror before he managed to escape. I've never seen so many dead people in my life, and some of my friends. Did. You know, I've never seen someone's face shot off in front of me. It's not cool. Not pretty. I can't get out of my head. Shot all around me. <laughs> they got automatic weapons, sawed off shotguns, and pipe bombs. We are Columbine. Speaking of survivors, We Are Columbine 2018 is a documentary featuring four survivors and a few faculty members who tell the story of their experiences with the massacre and how it impacted their lives. It's named after a bit of a movement arranged by students and teachers when returning to Columbine High School. Classes had temporarily been moved to the nearby Chatfield High School until Columbine was cleaned up and was no longer a crime scene. Students apparently walked into the school chanting, We are Columbine, while wearing shirts printed with the same slogan. It was supposed to restore and reinforce school pride. Denver Post reported on June 30th, 1999, a Columbine High School graduate erected a simple flag atop North America's highest peak to commemorate victims of the massacre and encourage survivors to move forward with their lives. The flag was designed by Columbine sophomores Shannon and Shelby Myers. The twin sisters decorated a white flag with fabric paint with the Columbine flower painted on one side and the now famous slogan, We are Columbine and We will strive to survive on the other side. The flag is our way of saying we need to move forward but not forget, Shannon Myers said. It's our way of reclaiming our school, Shelby Myers said.